All right, everyone, good afternoon. Thanks so much for being here. And uh, yeah, we're about to get started in five minutes for our uh, class meeting today on Thursday, February the 4th. So wherever you are, if you're watching this now, later, past, present, or future, glad that you're here. And uh, just get comfortable. we got about five minutes, and then we'll really get rolling. Welcome, everybody, to class. You're having a good day so far and a nice first week of the uh, semester. Welcome back. Hello guys, welcome back. Nice day out there. <clears throat> I wonder if this is your guys' last class today. People have more classes coming later. What's everybody's Thursday all about? For me, this is my last meeting of the day. I've taught three other meetings so far today. And then um, just have you guys, and then I'm out at 3.45. Good to go until tomorrow. <clears throat> Welcome guys, welcome to class, thanks for being here. Just have about two or three minutes until it's 2.20 and then um, that's when I'll get everything going. For now though, good to see you guys. Welcome, welcome to class. <clears throat> cool, just a couple more moments. <clears throat> Notice usually everybody kind of just appears right at class time or even a few minutes into it. So, especially on the first day, it takes a little time to uh, locate the stream and channel. But it's good that you guys are here a little early. Hey there, Nathan. Nice to see you. Good to see you today. <clears throat> oh, huh. well, you know, Alex, I mean, 
if you just watched the previous stream, are you, wait, so I'm sorry, you're enrolled in this section, then, but you watched the whole class just that I delivered just now. If you did, then I mean, there's really no necessary reason to come to this because it's the same information, but, uh, but yeah. Um, I guess it's good though. You want to get a sense of your actual classmates and you know your actual um, camaraderie with these folks. So yeah, you can hang in there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, but you'll you'll notice that I label the um, the meeting with the information that pertains to the section that it is. Uh, so that's one way for you to make sure if you're ever confused which section corresponds to us. We have our time slot for this class between two twenty and three forty five. Uh, but I have another class that meets just prior to this from 12.45 to 2.10. Okay, guys, so thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, it's great to see you guys. Let me just start off by mentioning a couple basic things. Um, this is YouTube Live, and this is our platform that we're going to be using as we go throughout the whole semester. Yeah, not to worry, Alex. It's all good. Um, but here we are, and it's YouTube Live. So you guys obviously have found this class uh, and this channel. So just so you know, this is how we're going to meet every Tuesday and Thursday from 2.20 to 3.45 p.m. It's really not too difficult. You just have to use this channel or follow the link and uh, attend by clicking it at that time on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I'll be here running the meetings, and we'll all be collected together, capable of you know contributing our comments, questions, reactions to whatever we're learning. And um, the lectures will stay uploaded to the channel permanently. So if you ever want to rewatch something or look at it a second time later on, you can easily come back to it and um, review it for your notes or for any other reason. Um, so that's just my first few things to say. I try to help people find the meeting also by mailing out an announcement just prior to class now. Um, so uh, in the future, I don't think I will give that quick previous to the class announcement like, hey, come to this link. Because now that you're here and now that you've done it once, um, you understand the format, and going forward, we'll just do the same thing. So let me do this, um, and this will also give you a little bit of experience learning how to use our interface here and how to interact. Um, you see the chat, right, the live chat? I'm going to pretty much use this live chat, of course, for our in-class interaction, but also as a way of like recording attendance and stuff. So if you're here, you're present, you're watching me, and you haven't yet commented or said anything in the chats, uh, just go ahead and type in a comment. It could be just good afternoon, hello, or present, or anything else, and that will be my little record of your attendance. The comments written in the live chat remain also permanently archived on the page and in the video. So if I ever really want to, I can go back and check on or verify attendance. Like I told you guys, I'm not very um, punitive about that, and I'm not very strict with it, but I do like to keep a record, and sometimes the school even wishes for me to keep attendance records for... Uh, financial aid and other purposes that they sometimes audit. So at any rate, yeah, just say hi in the chat. And here's the only other thing I'd say about that. Sometimes you're going to have a screen name or username that's a little different from your name on the roster. Like you can see here, uh, Danny Swirly Anime Show 2000. If you have a different username, no problem with that. But just do include then in your um, in your note that records attendance what your name is on my roster so that I can associate your presence here with the uh, identity you have on the roster. Okay, guys, so that's great. So hopefully everyone heard me. Make sure that you um, get your attendance noted by simply uh, typing in a comment, okay? And that's how we begin today's meeting. Okay, so as I said, if you have ever got questions, comments, anything that you would like me to repeat or you know um, revisit, explain, expand on, just jump right in in the comments, and I'll see your comments in real time, and um, we'll just take them in the order they come in. Okay, good to see everybody here. Hi, Corey, Anna, Brittany, Danny, Jordan, Philip, Matt, Remy, Janae, of course, um, Anna, Tan, Lan, Oliver. Appreciate all you guys' attendance today, Nathan, etc. Great. So um, today's the first meeting, and let's just kind of jump right into our um, notes. I've got some notes prepared for you guys on the basic idea of critical thinking, what it is to be a good critical thinker, um, what is argument, what is the difference between um, truth and belief, and a lot of other interesting things in between. So to set the stage for the semester, this is a class that's called um, Critical Reasoning and Writing, and often we just call it Introduction to Critical Thinking. So I kind of want us to set a good foundation by all kind of learning what is 
a good critical thinker. If we are trying to teach you guys how to be good critical thinkers or make you at least better at critical thinking, then we want to know what is our goal. What is the standard that we're trying to get to? So that's where I'll begin. And we're going to now just create these notes. What is a good critical thinker? Okay. Okay, so a good critical thinker, everybody, it's a type of person that uh, wouldn't, will not believe a claim unless it is based on good evidence or a good argument. Okay, so if you're a good critical thinker, you don't just accept everything that you hear, read, or see. You're willing to believe things, yes, but only if and when it can somehow be supported by high quality reasons, evidence, or arguments. So that's the first point about this definition. This is a person who will not believe a claim unless it is um, <clears throat> supported by good evidence or good argument. Okay, so let's focus on this uh, concept just for a bit as you see it. It's a person that wouldn't believe something unless it's supported by, based on good evidence, good argument. So good critical thinkers, you can think of it as are a little bit um, skeptical by nature. Their automatic response to hearing information given to them is not, wow, I didn't know that, How, that's crazy. Instead it's like, but are you sure? How do you know? What's the evidence though? Like what reasons do you have that could make this seem rational, that could make this seem justifiable? Critical thinkers don't want to believe things that are false. So they try their best to screen off the false beliefs by only accepting claims that are justifiably based on good evidence and arguments. Okay? And this is actually one of the most important skills to have in life. I think that in a way it's overlooked sometimes, even in our um, K through 12 education, you know, we reach our adult years and we haven't yet really been given a robust and rigorous um, course in how to distinguish truth from fiction, um, what's actually happening from what's just make-believe or fantasy. So if you're a good critical thinker, it's not just for the sake of everybody else that you do that. It's not just so that you can impress your parents and teachers and friends. Of course, it has that effect as well, but the main reason is because it's a benefit to you. A good critical thinker is not easily manipulated, not easily exploited or fed lies. It's not the type of person who you can easily trick. Or, for example, a gullible person is the last type of person who would be a critical thinker. Critical thinkers can't be fooled, tricked, deceived, manipulated, or exploited. And that makes them much more um, able to act in their own interest and towards their own self-advantage. Um, if you're a bad critical thinker, you're easily going to be preyed upon by the clever and enterprising competitive world that we have where some people will try to sell you products that you maybe don't need or try to win your belief to a cause that is not in your best interests. So being a good critical thinker is of fundamental importance for your life and as a citizen and as a member of uh, human civilization and American society. So um, you're also usually given intellectual respect when you're the kind of person who holds these higher standards of evidence before you're willing to accept a claim. But that's actually only like half of the definition, so let me continue to add a little more. First of all, yeah, it is a person who wouldn't believe something unless it was based on, supported by good evidence or arguments. But on the other hand, when a critical, the same kind of person, when a good critical thinker is making a claim to somebody, when they're presenting a claim to another person or audience, then they also are capable of providing good evidence or arguments to back their own claims up. Okay, so let me add that. And when making claims to others, when making claims to others, they provide good evidence and argument to, to support their claims.
Okay, so um, if, if we were, you know, lower animals, you know, we're all human beings here, but of course there's other life forms on the planet Earth, there's other living things, and if you think about what it is to be like a non-human animal, it's much less complicated in a certain sense, right? It's just you just live, eat, reproduce, sleep, and that's pretty much it. Um, but we're humans, and we have much more um, intellect, we have much more rational insight into the world. And so we deal with information. It's only me and you humans that can talk about, I don't know, the periodic table of elements or that can know that we're like the third planet from the sun or can know facts about history that predate our own birth. You know, animals are living in the moment and they don't have to deal with all these complex things having to do with language, information. And so human beings deal with information. Sometimes you're the one receiving information and that can be from any number of external sources. Sometimes you find it on the internet. Sometimes it's coming to you through the media, whether that's television, radio, print media, or whatever. Sometimes it's your friends or parents or coworkers who pass on information to you that you just hear secondhand. When you're the one who's the recipient of information from wherever, you wanna kind of thoroughly vet and investigate whether the information is worthy of your own belief. So a good critical thinker kind of has a filter through which incoming claims have to pass. And they won't pass through and get into their belief system unless they're somehow justified and based on good evidence and arguments. So good critical thinkers are hesitant to believe something without the right evidence. Otherwise, you know, why should I believe it if it can't be proven or if evidence can't be given in favor of it? Now, since a good critical thinker expects to receive good evidence and arguments before they believe something that someone else reports, then when they are on the other side of the equation giving information claims to other people, the good critical thinker makes sure that they provide the kind of good evidence and arguments to back their own claims that they expect when they're on the receiving end. So when you're receiving the info, you need to hear that evidence and arguments. Otherwise, you say, I'm not sure. And when you're sending the information out to someone else, you don't just throw out a claim without having any kind of way of backing yourself up. So a good critical thinker wouldn't just say, for example, um, you know, there's, there's global warming is real. And you ask them, okay, what's the argument? And they say, I don't know. I just, that's what I think. I mean, there's great evidence and good arguments that global warming is real, but if you're a good critical thinker, you would have the reasons that you could provide. You would say, for example, that going back in history, if you look at meteorological data, weather data, um, all the hottest years globally recorded have all been clustered towards the tail end of the timeline since the year 2000. And so that shows a heating trend. Therefore, you know, I've got this belief and this claim that global warming is real. But in that case, the person gives a reason. They don't just shrug their shoulders and be like, I don't know, it's just a hunch. Um, so good critical thinkers can give evidence and arguments to back their views up, and they also need to hear those good evidence and arguments before they're going to accept another claim as true. Okay? So that's the first thing I want to tell you guys about. Now, we're also going to have to learn the about the other side of this divide. What is it to be a bad critical thinker? Now, having learned what is a good critical thinker, the definition of bad critical thinker is pretty easy to master because it's just the opposite. So, um, bad critical thinker... Okay, so it's just a person who will believe information, will believe claims that are not based on good evidence or good arguments. Okay, so they'll believe things, they'll just believe whatever. They'll believe things for no good reason. Uh, someone says something to them and they're like, whoa. They just, they accept it as true without even further question. Okay, so these are people who are, sometimes we call them gullible, sometimes we call them credulous. These are people who don't insist on evidence. They just believe things. Oftentimes it's just because they hope it's true. Maybe it's because they want it to be true and therefore they don't use any high standards of evidence they just believe it despite the absence or unawareness of evidence that, that backs it up. And again, the second part, a bad critical thinker also, when making claims to others, they don't provide good evidence or arguments to back their claims. So.
Okay, so um, if you're a bad critical thinker, you're very casual and loose about the things you believe. You believe things even if there's not even a very good reason, and even if you haven't heard a very good reason why you should believe it. And if you're a bad critical thinker, you'll make claims to other people, but you can't back yourself up. You'll say something, and if somebody asks you why, though, you're like, I really actually don't know. It's just something that I think. So we're trying to become better critical thinkers and move away from this standard to the other standard of the good side to kind of um, stimulate our thinking about these definitions and concepts I kind of want to bring you guys into the discussion a little bit okay so here as a class let me ask you this who would you judge let's start with good critical thinkers who do you think would fit the description of a good critical thinker now this could be either specific individuals or if you want it could be types of people professions offices titles um, as long as you're able to explain why you think this is a good example, let me see what examples you may have. So put that into our chat here. Who in this world could reasonably be described as good critical thinkers? Good critical thinkers, people that won't believe things without good evidence or arguments. People who will be able to provide good evidence and arguments to stand up and back up their views. Okay, so I'm seeing a couple of good suggestions already. Janae, lawyers. Yes, uh, to be a lawyer is to go into a court of law and you have to stand up and make a case based on evidence that either proves guilt or disproves the accusation of guilt. So you can't just go up there and be like, hey, everybody, this guy's guilty. Uh, I don't know why. I just That's how I feel today. So can we get this over and vote on guilt? That's not doing lawyering. You have to make a case that's based on evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that a jury of your peers would find persuasive. So, yes, lawyers have to defend their claims with evidence. And... Um, that's a good example. Scientists, another fair and good example. Scientists have to come up with explanations about how the world works and about what the cause and effect relationships are in the world. Uh, so you couldn't be a scientist unless you could gain observ observable data um, to explain the occurrence of some events. And you'd also have to be able to generate um, experimental proof of your theory that could be replicated by other scientists. So you couldn't just be a scientist who says, here's my view of how things work and I don't even know why. That would not be possible as a scientist. So another good example of a good critical thinker. Police, you say, Ryan? I guess it does uh, depend, right? I mean, good police work, let's say like an investigator who goes to a scene of a crime and has to establish um, an identity of perhaps the criminal based on the forensic evidence, witness testimony, etc. You know, an effective police work like that kind could, of course, be a good critical thinker. When they, when they make an arrest, for example, they have probable cause to do it. At the same time, though, you know, there can be some people who um, you know, exercise their uh, official duties as an officer in a way that doesn't make people proud of what they've done. And so I know sometimes police officers come in for criticism for making um, heavy-handed arrests or for presuming things about um, the guilt or innocence of a person that they're not yet fully... Um, apprised of the facts in order to judge. So I don't want to like um, put my thumb on the scale and say whether there's never criticism that's fair. But yes, in the best case, good cops doing their best job are great critical thinkers. Um, public political speakers, you say, Kellen? I guess it does depend. That's another case of uh, case by case, I think. Because political craft is when you go up and you try and persuade the public of some uh, position that you want them to vote for or even on your own candidacy, right? So in the best case, a person would go up and make the reasonable argument to the voters, here's why it's good for you to vote for me, and here are why my policies are the better policies. But of course, we know that sometimes people can use their position of public, um, their, their public position or their authoritative position to mislead people or to simply try and win votes by deceptive tactics or rhetorical, emotional appeals. Uh, but in the best case scenario, yes, when our higher angels are guiding our political processes, then we would have that kind of political um, leadership. And I think that we in fact do in many cases, but it's not something that you can say is absolutely always seen in every case. You say me, Jordan, I appreciate that. Um, well, I mean, since I'm teaching critical thinking, I guess I should at least try my best to live up to those standards. And I think me and many academics in the field, uh, at least when it comes to our own subject of specialty, we are good critical thinkers. If you take like a history class, and uh, you ask a follow-up question to your professor, why though, why did um, Columbus want to sail to the New World in 1492? 
um, he shouldn't be like, oh, actually, I don't know that and I can't tell you. They should be able to defend and justify all the information they provide. And usually that's true. And of course, you have to be qualified to, to occupy those positions in the academy. So I would say that's a good example. Um, philosophers, judges, both good examples, Alex. When you're a judge, sometimes you have to render an opinion on guilt or innocence. In other cases, of course, you just oversee the court proceedings. Um, but you have to do that based on knowledge of the law, knowledge of the facts of the case, and you can't just make legal decisions as a judge without being able to justify them to the court and to the uh, parties being um, prosecuted or defended in the court. These are all good examples. Nathan, question. What constitutes good evidence or arguments? Is it a definition subjective from person to person? Good question, and hold on to that question, because we're actually going to really zoom in on that in a moment. Um, well, we'll talk at least about what a good argument is. What good evidence is, I suppose, is something that can be case specific. Um, but in general, good evidence is the kind of evidence that raises the probability of the conclusion such that based on that evidence, the conclusion is either inescapable or highly, highly likely. Um, and so it kind of just matters about what the subject matter of the uh, evidence is in the case given. Sometimes we're thinking about evidence about facts of guilt or innocence. Sometimes we're thinking about evidence, I don't know, in a social sense, like someone thinks their partner was cheating. Um, if they believe that, then there should be some reasons they believe it. Um, so it can come into play in all kinds of contexts, large and small, personal, interpersonal, professional, and academic. Um, Remy, I think it is good evidence if it doesn't hold any fallacies in it. Well, not, not that's good. Um, fallacies are when Arguments have logical errors or flaws, but the existence of a fallacy pertains to a whole argument, not just the evidence parts of it. That, though, is going to make a little more sense in just a moment when I start to tell you guys about the definition of arguments and how they look in the formal sense defined by logic. Okay, so, hi, Stephen, I see you there. If there's some technical issues, not to worry. To anybody who ever has, um, let me mention this, sometimes with the number of students there are and with everyone's different internet connection, there can sometimes be a student who sees a slowdown, maybe um, audio and video gets a little blurry for a moment. But I can tell you for sure that once they're all uploaded onto YouTube, um, the playback is perfect. And so even if you have something to cut out for a moment, just hang in there. Usually um, it comes back to the normal bandwidth and it starts to play normally again, even if there's an occasional slowdown. And then the playback, of course, that you can watch at a later time will be uh, not affected by that. Okay, Ryan, a person having a problem with believing the thing, is it saying something about thinker or something else? Uh, well, no, I mean, I have to think about your question. Someone has a problem believing something, so it could be because they're unwilling to believe it even though it's based on good evidence. In other cases, it could be that they don't believe it because the evidence isn't there. So if it's because there's not very good evidence to support it, like, um, like, I don't know, say aliens exist in outer space. Some people believe they do, some people don't think so. I would argue that it's probable just because there's life on this one planet and it's a big universe, but we don't have direct evidence that confirms the existence of extraterrestrial life. It's just based on inference. So um, if a person doesn't believe it, they might say, well, there has to be better evidence for it. Another person might say, well, I don't believe it because I don't want it to be true. Like, I hope that there's no aliens because that's just weird and maybe it means that you know, life on the planet Earth isn't special and created by like a being that has our same image or something. So sometimes you hesitate to believe something, not because there's no good evidence, but because you just don't like the idea. We're good critical thinkers or we're gonna try to be. So we're just gonna try to follow evidence wherever it leads. Sometimes evidence leads to a conclusion that you'd not prefer. But if, a, if you're a good critical thinker, you just try to face the uncomfortable truths, even if sometimes they're not to your liking, because we wanna have a correct appreciation of the world. So anyway, um, what about bad critical thinkers, guys? I've asked you a lot about what could be some examples of good ones. Um, let's flip to the other side. What do you think could be either individuals or types of people or offices, professions, categories of people, whatever, that are in the realm of the bad critical thinkers? If you were going to suggest some examples, what would you throw out there? <clears throat> Let's see, what do you think? Part of a religious cult, okay, good, flat earthers. Alex, you're saying your sister, I guess I wouldn't know that per se, but uh, fair enough. Presidents, um, okay, well, let's 
let's try and get into all of your guys' great examples here. People that are part of a religious cult, I think that is a good case. Because a person who's part of a religious cult believes what the cult figure, who's the leader, says, no matter what, even if it's totally contradicted by all the available evidence. To believe in a cult is to give total trust and absolute devotion to the words, actions, and commands of a charismatic cult figure. And um, people who do that are kind of totally unresponsive to contrary evidence, which is usually abundantly available, that, that shows and indicates that their beliefs are false. So that would be a good example. Um, flat earthers, yeah, so a person who believes the earth is flat, it's hard to imagine that people really do still think this. I mean, I guess what is their reason? They think that because when you're standing and just look, it looks like a flat horizon. I guess because you're so small and you're on the surface of it, but that's to be expected. Um, it's hard to imagine, though, why people think that when you look at the bigger picture. I mean, isn't it true that one part of the Earth right now has sunlight and another part, it's nighttime? Like if you go over to Australia or something, it's a totally different time of day. If this was a big flat disk, then every part of it would be bathed in sunlight at the same time. It only makes sense to say that the sunlight issue changes because we're rotating and one surface of the curved sphere is exposed to the light and not another. But anyway, yeah, if a person believes in flat earth, I would think that they don't have a very good basis in fact and evidence. Nonetheless, some will try to produce weird and specious arguments, suspicious arguments, to get to those conclusions. Brittany, you say presidents. I would look at it as a case by case. I mean, certainly many presidents and some presidents for sure that we have had in the United States have uh, fallen short of our higher standards of good critical thinking and rational evidence. Many people have said that about the former president that we just had. Um, I don't want to sort of pick on one particular party or whatever, but it's true that uh, we have seen the potential and the reality of uh, political corruption, misleading and false claims that have been perpetuated in order to serve a person's uh, personal or political agenda. But I don't want you to feel so um, downtrodden and uh, pessimistic about the possibility of people in public office to actually have um, high standards of rationality. Um, it's possible and it happens I think quite often so I wouldn't just put everyone in the same bucket as um, you know rabble-rousing, sensationalist, uh, unverified claims being issued from some of the mouths of the most powerful people. That does happen and it's sad but um, not everyone is the same so I think that some politicians and public servants do deserve respect and try their best but you know that's all I would say about that. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> you say Biden is off as well. I mean, that's, you know, Brittany, I mean, let's not try and be biased here. There is certainly potential for anybody, uh, whichever political identity they may associate with, to, to fall into like conspiratorial thinking, um, to insist on the truth of their claims without being able to justify them. So I don't know, it's not really, I wouldn't pick on one or the other political party. It's more the characteristic trait that can be found in people of whatever stripe. But yeah, fair point. Politicians oftentimes, sadly, are not good critical thinkers, which you would hope they would be since they are, have uh, such leadership and such authority. Is this getting too political for you? Sorry, Kellen. I mean, I'm just taking the comments that I see listed in our chat and I'm trying to expand on them. Um, some religious people who don't believe in the existence of outer space. Wow, that's difficult to understand. I mean, there is outer space. What are the stars? What is the moon? What is the sun? Maybe they believe there's only a local cosmos and there's not like a bigger, uh, expansive universe. That one I've not heard, but um, interesting. Um, let's see, what else? So anyway, guys, there's other examples. I could throw more cases out at you. Sometimes people say those that believe and follow tabloid journalism, you know, gossip, um, and rumor instead of you know trying to get the facts. Uh, sometimes people speak on little children, and it's really not um, their fault, of course. When you're a small child, you have to kind of rely on the things that parents, teachers, and members of your community tell you because you don't have the experience yet. So if I tell a little kid, the tooth fairy is coming to give you some money tonight, it's usually not going to be the response like, are you sure? What's the evidence? Prove to me that there's a tooth fairy. But, you know, we're no longer children, so we're trying to be the kind of people who do ask those follow-up questions and who do insist on high standards of evidence and fact and argument before we're willing to sign up for a belief ourselves. Okay? So, good. Now that we've had this little brief discussion about bad critical thinkers versus good critical thinkers, um, I hope you can understand that our goal in this class is to just make movement, some progress anyway, from the worst examples of the bad critical thinkers 
towards the best examples of the good critical thinkers, okay? So we want to not be the kind of people who just believe stuff for no good reason and spread ideas around without being able to prove them. And we also want to be the kind of people who do expect good evidence and arguments before we will accept a claim and who are able to back ourselves up with um, the kind of good solid reasons and evidence and arguments that make our claims justified. Okay, so then we move on to the next little term that I want us to all get clear on. We've said here so far that good critical thinkers are good at evaluating arguments and good at presenting arguments to defend their views. And we've said the opposite of bad critical thinkers. Those are folks who lack the ability to defend their views with arguments and they don't even expect to hear a good argument before they'd be willing to believe something someone said. But this means that we must now focus on what does the word argument even mean? What is an argument in the formal sense defined by logic and critical thinking? That's important because when you hear the word argument, I know a lot of you guys in everyday life, there's a different meaning of it that's different from its academic meaning, okay? And in everyday usage, sometimes you think of argument as like a bad thing. You know, you might have, you know, for decent reasons thought, oh, I don't want arguments. I think arguments are bad. We shouldn't have arguments. My parents got into arguments. Now they're divorced. Or when I get into arguments, people are being mean. But that's not what an argument is in the formal sense. In the sense defined by logic, an argument is a good thing. And we should seek to both present arguments and to engage with arguments. So an argument, it's not people being mean, yelling at each other, um, insulting each other, getting angry. It's none of that. An argument is simply something much more basic and fundamental. So here's the definition. It is a set of two or more sentences where one of the sentences is the conclusion and all the other sentences, all the others are premises. Okay, so argument, a set of two or more sentences where one of the sentences is the conclusion and all the other ones are called premises. Alex, is a good argument a debate? Okay, good question. Let me say this. Um, when you say debate, a debate goes on between two sides, usually. Like, I'm defending in this debate that the border wall is good and my opponent is defending the position that it's not good as a policy, right? Um, but an argument, although arguments are exchanged in the course of a debate, an argument as defined here doesn't necessarily even mean that there are two people involved. You can simply construct an argument for yourself just so that you can think about the reasons why one of your beliefs is justified, okay? So like I could just sit back in a chair with nobody around me anywhere, totally not communicating with anyone, and I could just think about my beliefs and try and state arguments for them to myself. So like I could sit back and be like, California is the best state. And I'm thinking in my mind, why? Okay, well, because, you know, um, we have some of the best natural scenery. We have some of the best big inner cities. Um, people are really laid back. Therefore, you know, California is the best state. Now, right there, I've thought about my reasons for having that view. And I'm not even debating anybody. It's just me talking to myself. So sometimes arguments are directed at others, like, hey, consider my argument. In other cases, you just recite them to yourself so that you can think about why you believe the conclusion of the argument. The highest taxes, yeah, we do have high taxes, but we buy something with those taxes, don't we? We have services, so, I mean, that's kind of nice. But anyway, yeah, um, argument. Now, let me show you an example of an argument written on the board. Uh, before I do that, though, I'm going to list the definition of this in our chat so that it, you can have it there. See there in the uh, the chat the definition written here. So now I can clear that away. 
<clears throat> okay, now, um, <clears throat> say that I've got this argument here. All dogs are mammals. Um, <clears throat> terriers are dogs. Okay. Um, now this is an argument that I'm stating here. These two are premises, and the conclusion is going to be written below. What do you think, little elementary reasoning, what is the conclusion that you would draw from those two pieces of info? <clears throat> what do you think is the resulting uh, statement that comes from those two? All dogs are mammals. Okay, point number one. Next, terriers are dogs, and therefore terriers are mammals. Good, Philip. Okay, now let me just point out, good, that's exactly right, uh, Philip, Joa, and the rest. This is the proper conclusion that follows from these two premises here. Let me diagram for you what are the various parts of the argument are. Okay, so this here, the bottom sentence, is the conclusion. And these numbered sentences above, these are the premises. Okay, so... What you're looking at is actually what we call the standard form of an argument, standard form. The standard form, so they always have to kind of visually look this way when you write them down in a logic class. The conclusion is provided at the bottom. So it's below, literally, it's below the other things. And then there's this horizontal line above the conclusion, and then the premises are listed above that line. Now the premises have to occur in a list. So when one of them is done, you have to like jump to the next available line below. They're not supposed to continuously run along on the same ledger, on the same horizontal line, okay? So numbering them is sometimes helpful because that kind of forces you to make sure that they're separated on individual lines. Um, let me make a note about that. So what standard form is, do I have any other markers over here? That's not gonna be a good one, sorry. I'm just gonna stick with the blue. Standard form. The conclusion is at the bottom, below a horizontal line, and then the premises are listed above that. Okay, standard form, and that's what this has. The conclusion is written at the bottom, and it's below this horizontal line, and the horizontal line is the divider between the conclusion and the premises that occur above. Now, every argument has to have at least one premise. Um, so there is no such thing as an argument which is just a single statement by itself. If that's the case, then it's not actually making an argument because there's no attempt to defend or justify or give reasons for that claim. Um, now listen, okay, the conclusion of the argument is the statement that you're trying to prove. You're trying to show that the statement is true. The premises, what role do you think they serve? So the conclusion is what you're trying to prove, and the premises, what is their role? How do they relate to the conclusion? How do they, um, you know, what is the premise there for? Let's try and get that point in the chat if we can. Conclusion, you're trying to establish this is true. You're trying to show this. You're trying to prove this, persuade people of this. The premises are the what part of the argument. What do you think? Yeah. 
Nothing? Okay, yes, good, Oliver. It's the evidence. It's the evidence that justifies, that backs the conclusion, okay? Now, in this case, it's kind of a weird argument because the conclusion is not something really debatable that anyone would really disagree about. But when we make arguments, we can make them over all kinds of controversial and debated claims. Suppose that I want to make the case to you that, um, you know, California is the best state, like I said earlier. If that's my conclusion, then I have to advance some premises that give a reason to think so. So if I wanted to make that argument, maybe I could say that, I don't know, we have um, some of the best beaches and we have the best weather um, and we have the seventh largest economy in the world. Therefore, we're the best country. In that case, I gave three different reasons which were supposed to give a basis to support the conclusion claim. Okay. Um, so let me make that clear by, by writing that note here. <clears throat> So conclusion, it is the sentence or the statement, uh, the claim that you are trying to prove to be true. Okay, and then the premises. are just the um, reasons or evidence that supports the conclusion. Okay, so just give you guys clear definitions of all these um, concepts that apply to argument and logic. So you're learning this, that a good critical thinker is a person who wouldn't believe a claim unless there was some kind of solid evidence or argument to back it up. And a good critical thinker likewise is able to present claims based on good arguments when they claim things to other people. They're able to present evidence and arguments to defend their own views, unlike the bad critical thinker who just believes whatever for no good reason and also uh, will make claims to other people without having a solid ability to, to defend it or present an argument for it. Now, what is an argument then? That's the next point. If this is something that good critical thinkers can present and evaluate, and bad critical thinkers not so much, then we have to be clear about what it is. So an argument is a set of two or more sentences, and in every single argument there's one conclusion and at least one premise. There can be more than one premise, like in this case we have two, but minimally there has to at least be one. It can be one, two, three, or a greater number than one, but if there's not any, then it's not an argument. Okay, now what is the conclusion? The conclusion of the argument is the claim, the statement that you're trying to prove to be true to some audience or even just to yourself. And the premises are the reasons or evidence given, listed above, that support the conclusion. And as I mentioned, the standard form of presenting an argument visually looks like that on the page. Now, um, <clears throat> see... So yeah, the, the concept of argument is so central to what we're doing that we really have to make sure that that's clear for all of us. Let me give you another quick question, all right? <clears throat> Here's a question then. What if I just said this? The Lakers are the best team in basketball. The Lakers are the best NBA team. So I just say that, that by itself. Is that an argument? Let me know. What do you think? Basic question. Saying that the Lakers are the best basketball team, does this constitute an argument? Okay, Joa, Remy, good, you're saying no. And that's right. And to anyone else with the same answer, that's correct. But, okay, let's get into it. Why is it not an argument based on what you've now learned? Why is it that that statement is not an argument? The statement again that the Lakers are the best NBA team. Why would you say, as you have said, that that's not an argument? What's, what's the reason for your answer? Why is it not an argument? What's wrong? Okay, good, guys. There's no reasons, exactly. It's just one sentence by itself. Now, could a person give an argument for that claim? Yeah, and yeah, people do. You know, people, uh, you watch sports and sports commentary and, like, sports journalism. People make whole career out of it, right? Like, defending their viewpoint. Who's the best player? Who's the best team? Who's not? Right, so like, um, 
what could be an argument that the Lakers are the best team in basketball? I, I mean, I actually think that that's true. Um, and I could argue for it, you know? So what would be the argument? Here's the conclusion. Lakers are the best team. So if this is an argument, if we want it to be an argument, we have to construct some premises that give evidence of this. And so, I mean, what might be the reasons? Um, the Lakers just won the NBA title, so that's one premise that you can give. And, you know, you could also, I guess, mention that they have, um, well, you're talking about their, their current standings. Are they the first seed right now? Uh, if they are, then that's another good premise. They're the number one seed. In the West. And so therefore the Lakers are the best team. But this by itself, even if you think it's true, would not be an argument in and of itself because it has to come attached with some at least at least one reason. You know, and I could have marshaled additional reasons too. I could have said they've got LeBron James, who's historically one of the greatest players statistically. So therefore the Lakers are the best team. So anytime an argument exists, it can't just be one sentence by itself, even if it's a true sentence. If I tell you America is the greatest country in the world, maybe that's true, maybe I believe that. But by, by itself, it doesn't count as an argument. There have to be reasons. And you could make up some premises for that. You could say, well, we have the most powerful military, and we have the most wealth, and we have the most enduring constitutional framework, I guess. So therefore, we're the greatest country in the world, if you believe that. So arguments can be given to defend any claim. Sometimes they're given to defend opinions. Sometimes they're given to defend factual claims or questions of guilt or innocence or of um, right or wrong. But when we make arguments, we have to at least try to provide certain premises to defend the conclusion of the argument. Okay. So you understood, I guess, and that's good, that just having one sentence by itself is never an argument. Uh, it has to contain at least a premise in there. Okay. Now let me ask you another quick question. Or, if, well, let me give you some info and then I'll ask a question. When we get to the end of the premises and then we say the conclusion, we, what we call, infer the conclusion from the premises. So the premises are reasons that are supposed to establish the truth of the conclusion. And we say that we infer or deduce that conclusion from the premises. But not just every random collection of sentences adds up to an argument, okay, even if there's more than one. So let me give you another new example. Suppose that I told you this. I, well, Dr. Vulich lives in Long Beach. Dr. Vulich is a philosophy professor. And Dr. Vulich has a cat. Now, what I just told you, is that an argument or not? I said three things. I live in Long Beach, I'm a professor, and I have a cat. Is that an argument? Correct. It's not an argument. It's not just one sentence, but it's still not an argument. And why would you guess or judge that that does not count as an argument? What's wrong with it so that it's not an argument? Well, that's a statement. There are three statements, right? Um, and statements are found in arguments, actually. So that wouldn't be the problem. Well, yeah, so good, Jordan. I like the way you're putting it. There's no conclusion. The way to look at it is this. None of those statements are evidence for any of the others. It's not like I'm saying, I live in Long Beach, therefore I have a cat. Or I'm a professor, therefore I live in Long Beach. These things are not the reasons for each other. They're just unrelated, true statements about me. So it's only an argument where the premises serve as evidence for the conclusion, and that's their connection between each other. But these three sentences that I mentioned are not connected in that way. It's not like saying... You know, since I'm a professor, therefore I live in Long Beach. That doesn't make sense. It's not like I made the choice to live here due to being a professor. Um, and it's not like I chose to have a cat because I live in Long Beach or because I'm a teacher of philosophy. So when you have an argument, you're going to notice that the premises connect to the conclusion because we infer the conclusion from the premises. And that's like a case like this. We have some information given here, and it leads us to believe this is true. But you're not led to believe that I have a cat by me telling you 
that I live in Long Beach or that I teach philosophy. And so I could tell you stuff about what's in my fridge. I have some sparkling water, I have some beer in there, and you know, I have some like, uh, I don't know, like I have a fish fillet that I could cook up. Um, those are three things that are in my fridge, but this is not an argument because I'm not saying some of these things are the reasons or evidence for the other thing. Okay, so just want to clarify that too. Now, um, <clears throat> next up, I want to talk to you guys about something pretty fundamental. So now, let's get into this. We said that the whole point of making out arguments and presenting them is to show or to persuade that the conclusion is what? Let me hear that word again, if you can remember. We make arguments in an effort to demonstrate what about the conclusion? The whole point of these arguments is, is to showcase that what, the conclusion is what? Just fill in the blank. We're trying to prove, show, demonstrate, persuade that the conclusion is, wait for it, what? Let me know in the chat when you're ready. We make an argument so that we can try and show people or make the case that the conclusion is, okay, so Remy, you say that the conclusion is right. Um, that's okay, yeah. What's another word for the word right that seems to be more prevalent in discussions of like uh, this kind? Yes, true. You're trying to show that the conclusion is true. Conclusive, not so much, Joa. It's kind of like, um, that, that means almost the same as conclusion. But yes, that the conclusion is true. You're trying to show that the conclusion is true. You're trying to show it's true. So that's the whole point. But now that requires us to ask another big question. What does this word truth mean, though? What is the definition of truth? Okay, so let's kind of consider this. It's interesting to teach this topic about what truth means because um, it's a word that we've all used. We use it all the time. We think we understand it. But it's like only when you finally take a philosophy class and the professor says, but what is truth? you realize that it's kind of a slippery idea and it's a little bit hard to pin down. It seems like whenever you're asked to defend, define it, you end up saying something that's just a synonym for true, like correct or right. But let's try our best. What would you say would it take for a sentence to be a true sentence? Like if I say something, what would have to be the situation if that saying of mine is a true thing to say? What makes a sentence or a statement true? If you wanted to try and take a stab at that. Let's see. Talking about what makes a sentence a true one. Like we say sentences all the time. We're saying stuff every day, writing stuff. So Brittany, you say factual. And I actually like that a lot. That's very good. Um, when you say something true or when you write something true, it's something that does match to the facts. Now, let me take a few of the other comments that I'm seeing here. Joa, Kellen, Matt, I gotta push back, unfortunately. But it's okay that you say that, and it's not a problem, because here, you're in good company. Every time I teach this class, and I've done so for many years, I've noticed the pattern that when I ask what truth means, that's the most intuitive common response that students will give, the, the answer you gave, which is it's something backed by evidence, or it's something that has evidence. But I'm sorry to say that's not actually correct. And here's why. Okay, let me explain. Something can be true even if nobody has evidence that can prove it. It could just be true even though it's unknown. Okay, so like perhaps a strange example, but follow me, right? Um, I was watching Night Stalker on Netflix recently. And so this is like a documentary series on Netflix about Richard Ramirez, who was this notorious serial killer in the late 80s, right? And anyway, um, he killed a lot of people, and some of those people, we never even found them. So imagine a scenario of like a serial killer who killed a person and disposed of the body in a way where no one ever found the body. And suppose this serial killer never confessed to the killing and maybe died with the knowledge that he had of where the body was. Now take the point of view of the family members and friends of the victim. For all they know, this person just went missing and they disappeared, and they don't know where they are or what happened, so they speculate. Are they still alive and they went into hiding? Did they commit suicide? Did they fall into the ocean and get into an accident and that's why we never heard from them again? Or did they get abducted, killed, murdered? Who knows, right? So from their point of view, they don't know what the truth is. 
But couldn't it still just be true that this person was murdered and they're buried in the desert? Yeah. So something can be true even when people don't have the evidence to show it. Of course, we want to have evidence because when you have evidence, that's giving you a good reason to think something is true. So we should try and base our beliefs on evidence. But nonetheless, a fact can still be a fact even if no one is aware of it and no one can prove it. Okay, does this make sense to you? So it is just the fact of something that makes a sentence true. Let me give you another example. There's a certain number of people alive right now in the world, like, right, just human beings. And so um, this number of people is either a number that's divisible by two or it isn't. So it's either an even number or it's an odd number, you see? Now, I don't know which one it is, but it's got to be one of the two cases. So it's just a fact right now that there's either an even or an odd number of people, even though I have no way of proving at all which case it is. Okay, so you kind of follow me here. This is why I had to correct the one comment that um, even without evidence to show what the facts are, there are still facts, right? Right now, aliens uh, maybe don't exist. Maybe they do exist. I, I don't know. But one of those two things is true, even though I can't prove which side it is. Okay, so now, having gone into that little sidebar, what do you think it means for a statement to be true? It has more to do with these sentences that you've written about facts, okay? So it's about corresponding with reality. When a sentence is true, whatever it's saying matches or mirrors the real actual facts of reality. So let me put that here. It is simply when what a sentence says matches the facts of reality. Okay, so there's got to be this match between what's saying and what the real facts are. So let me give you some more examples then. Here's a sentence. Dr. Vulich is wearing glasses. So tell me, is it true? Is it true that I'm wearing glasses? True or false? Easy. Or is it? I don't know. You can tell me, though. What do you think? Did I say the truth when I say I'm wearing glasses right now? Yeah, it's true. And it's easy to verify. Look at me. This is live. We're, we're live right now. So, yeah, I am wearing glasses. Now, what if I told you, it's not a filter, sorry, Joa, but I understand that those exist. How about this? What if I told you that I'm wearing a hat? Is that true? It's another thing I'm saying. Am I saying something true when I tell you right now I'm wearing a hat? Give me my answer. True or false with the hat sentence? False. Obviously so. Good. Now, why is the one sentence true but not the other one? Well, it's because of the facts. When I say I'm wearing glasses, I'm not just saying it. Here they are on my head, and so that's a fact. If I say I'm wearing a hat, this is not a true thing. I'm speaking the falsehood because I'm saying something, but if you look in reality, there's nothing there. There's no hat there. So we can say whatever we want. We can say things that are not true or that are true, but whether it's true or not depends on reality, depends on the objective reality. So, you know, if I say to you that um, Joe Biden is the president, that's a, that's a fact. He is in the office of the presidency. If I say to you that um, Michelle Obama is the president, this is not a fact, and that's a false statement. Sometimes people say things that are false on purpose, and that's when they're trying to be deceptive, right? Say that someone was cheating on their partner and the partner called them out and said, are you cheating on me? And they say, no, 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 I'm not. I would never do that. They were, okay? So when they say they weren't, but they actually in fact were, then they're saying something false. Um, so the truth is just whatever's real, whatever are the facts. And sentences bear truth when they say of what is happening that it is happening, okay? So now we're trying to be these good critical thinkers, right? And as good critical thinkers and just as everyday people, right, we would hope that most all of our um, ideas are true. But actually now I have to move into a new definition to expand on that point. So hopefully this has come through clearly to you. What makes facts different from evidence, Alex? Um, well, no, I mean, evidence can be factual, of course, and it should be if it's going to be the thing you 
cite as reasons uh, for proof of something. Uh, but evidence specifically is evidence because of the relationship it has to something else. So like, for example, Alex, on your question, suppose that there was a murder that happened and we are investigators trying to find out who did it. And we see a footprint of a particular type of shoe leading into the crime scene. And we then take photos of it, take a cast of it, and we have this footprint as evidence. Evidence to help establish the identity of the killer. If we find somebody later on who has a matching shoe, then we would say the print left at the crime scene was evidence that it's him. Now, without thinking about what the print means or how it could prove anything, you could just look at the print and say there's a fact that there's a shoe print here. The fact becomes evidence when it's used to support another claim, okay? So any fact, I guess, could be evidence depending on the situation, right? Like I'm wearing a gray sweater. You could say that that's evidence that I like sweaters. But also, if you don't want to think of it as proof of anything, you could just say, point out the fact. He is wearing the gray sweater, regardless of what that might mean for anything else that I might judge or interpret on the basis of it. Okay, so I mean, it's a kind of subtle question you ask, but hopefully that explains something. Um, there's no essential difference. It's just the purposes of the facts in proving something turns them into a piece of evidence. I, I, I hope that that clarifies a little bit, okay? Good. So that's the word truth. When whatever the sentence says matches those facts. Um, what's next is the term belief. And I'm presenting these definitions to you in a given order because uh, we have to know what truth is before we can define what is a belief because it kind of piggybacks on the definition of truth. So let's figure that out. What do you think it means if a person believes a sentence? If you have a belief in a given sentence, what do you think that means about you and your attitude toward that sentence? Say that you believe the statement that the earth is round. Okay, very good, Philip. Very quick, I like that. It's a person thinking the sentence is true, exactly. So a belief is when a person thinks that or judges that a sentence is true. Okay, so when someone thinks a sentence is true, they believe it. Beliefs, okay, are subjective, meaning two people can disagree about the same statement. One person thinks it's true, they believe it. The other person doesn't think it's true, they don't believe it, okay? So beliefs, we can have differences of opinion about the same thing, but truth is objective. So like say that there's one person, take the sentence that the earth is round. One guy says, I believe it is. And his weird friend says, no, I don't think it's round. So they don't agree. One person thinks it's true, that it's really a fact about reality that this is a round planet. And another person is saying, I don't think that's actually real. But there's only one fact. Okay, there's two opinions, but there's one fact. There's one shape the planet has. It's not both spherical and flat. That's like logically contradictory and impossible. So when we make a judgment about what we think is true, we form a belief. Uh, take this silly uh, argument that the election was stolen. I mean, people, some of them believe that. So you can say, here's the statement, Joe Biden fairly won the election. And many people, I think most all people believe, yes, that's the actual truth. That's the fact. Someone else might say, if they're you know, skeptical or hostile toward democracy or whatever, they might say, no, I don't think that's really true. So two people, different beliefs. But still, it's either true or it isn't. They can't both be correct. If we don't agree on something, we can't both be right. So um, if I believe that aliens exist and you don't, we cannot both be correct, but we can each have our own beliefs. We can each think about our own view being the true one, but it's not possible for the aliens to exist, but also to not exist. So it's one or the other, and it's not both, but two opinions can exist about it. So as good critical thinkers and everyday people, we want, we hope, that more of our beliefs will turn out to be true rather than false. Because based on the definition of true and false that you're now learning, if you have a head full of false beliefs, if you filled your mind with a bunch of false information, 
then that means that you're disconnected from reality. You're like not literally, in that case, you're not living in reality. You think that things are the case, and in fact, they're not the case. So nobody, I would hope, wants to live in a delusion or in a mistaken viewpoint about what's actually happening and what's real and correct. Now, that doesn't mean that any of us will ever be perfect and we'll have just absolute accuracy and never get false beliefs. But what we can do is make progress, right? So any number of us, any one of us, can do a little bit better than we do now. And we can uh, apply better standards of evidence and arguments so that when we have beliefs, we're likelier to get them correct. That doesn't mean that we'll ever be perfect and have 100% belief accuracy. But by trying to be good critical thinkers and insisting on good evidence and arguments before we assign ourselves a belief, we're likelier to screen off the false ones from making it into our mind and only accept in those that are really true. Okay, um, So that's the big picture of our class in a way. We're trying to be good critical thinkers, people that are good at presenting arguments and evaluating them. Arguments are given to show that a conclusion is true, meaning that it's really something that is a fact. Beliefs are whatever you think the facts are, whatever you think is true. And in the best case scenario, we would be skilled and rational enough that when we judge something true, it usually is, even though none of us are perfect and perfection isn't perhaps the goal, but just progress and better accuracy and judgment. Okay, now, um, again, at any point, if anything I'm saying you want to expand on, clarify, go back over, jump in whenever you like, and I'm always happy to take your comments. But um, what I want to go through now is just what are some different types of sentences that there are, okay? <clears throat> So different types of sentences. Let's talk about three types. So one category of sentences mentioned in logic and grammar are what are called assertoric sentences. Assertoric. And an assertoric sentence is built on the notion of an assertion. So this is just any statement that, or any sentence that is either true or false. Okay, so an assertoric sentence is a sentence that is either true or false. In logic jargon, we sometimes say that this is a sentence that has a truth value. In logic, we say that there are two truth values. There is truth and falsehood. And every sentence which has a truth value has exactly one of those two, but not both. Um, Nathan Quick uh, says, so am I right to assume that a good argument or evidence is one based largely in the facts of reality? Well, a good argument is one where we're going to expand on the co concept of a good argument um, on Tuesday. So your, your question is going to be given much more attention then. But just as a sort of preview of it for now, a good argument is one where the premises lead to the uh, conclusion, where the premises imply that the conclusion is true. So if you assume those premises to be true, then the conclusion would either have to be true or would very likely have to be true on the basis of the premises. So one quality of a good argument is that the conclusion follows from the premises. Another, of course, quality of a good argument is that the premises are true. But those are two different points of evaluation. One is about the validity of the form of the argument, and the other is about what we call its soundness. So um, a good argument can be good in both ways, because all the evidence statements are true, but also if the evidence statements really lead us to the conclusion. Sometimes you can have one of those strengths, but have the other missing. So you can have a bunch of true premises, but they don't really imply the conclusion. Right? That would be like me saying, I'm a male, and therefore I'm a professor. That's not a very good argument, even though the premise is true, and so is the conclusion, because the premise doesn't really establish the conclusion with any accuracy. Another thing that's good about an argument is when the premises do lead to the conclusion. But sometimes they can lead to the conclusion, even though the assumptions of the premises are false. So in the best case scenario, you would have both. The premises lead to the conclusion, and the premises are facts. But short of that, um, at least one of those two strengths being present would be better than nothing. Okay, but great question, Nathan. So an assertoric sentence, any sentence that's either true or false. So if I say to you that the Eiffel Tower is in Paris, that's a true assertion, and that's an assertoric sentence. If I tell you that the Eiffel Tower is in Virginia, that's a false sentence. It's a sentence, it's an assertion, 
but it's an assertion uh, not of fact, but of falsehood. So it's a false assertion. Um, both types of sentence are assertions, just one is true and one is false. Now these, I place a little asterisk here because they're of special importance because these are the only types of sentences that fill in the position of a premise or a conclusion in a logical argument. So with attention to arguments that are going to be written and spoken, it's only assertions that are given as those statements filling the premises and conclusion. But there are a couple of other types of sentences too, so let's go into that. There's also what's called interrogatives. And it's easy to explain what those are. Those are just questions, okay? So as the root of the word indicates, interrogate, an interrogative is a question sentence. And so, simple enough, it's any sentence that ends with a question mark. And you guys know the infinite variety that there are of those. What day is it? What time is it? Where is the bathroom? What's your favorite color? Um, um, what should I wear? Um, what time is the meeting? You understand? Like, these are all questions. And that's a different function of language. When you're asking questions, you're not claiming anything. You're not asserting something. And that's obvious because think of how awkward and inappropriate it would be to respond to a question with the judgment that it's true or false. Like if someone says, where's the bathroom? You can't say false. That doesn't make sense. But to any assertion, you could report back, no, it's not true. If somebody says the earth orbits um, the moon, you say false. But if someone asks, does the earth orbit the moon? You couldn't say false. You just have to answer their question. So this is a request for information that you don't have. And this is making a claim of information. Now, a third type of sentence are what are called imperatives. And imperative sentences are just commands. That's another type of role of language. So it, um, commands, <clears throat> it's when you try to direct a person's action or behavior or even just dictate to them. So if I say to you, uh, shut the door, write this down, Close your books. Uh, take out the trash. These are all impelling you to do something, commanding you. It's not asking you a question. It's also not making an assertion. It's just directing behavior. Um, you know, uh, get out of the car. Put your hands behind your head. Get on the ground. You know, these are commands that you can imagine like an authoritative police figure perhaps giving. So that's another part of language. Notice that it's not making an assertion. It's not like someone says to you, sit down, and you're like, true or false, you either just do it or don't do it. It's certainly not asking you a question, but rather dictating to you something to do. Now, I say there's three types of sentences, and these are the main three. So everything you say pretty much boils down to you're asking a question, you're telling someone what to do, or you're making a claim. Um, sometimes we also refer to a fourth kind. I didn't want to maybe emphasize it, but they're called exclamations. And exclamations are just like these momentary expressions which reveal your inner state of mind. They oftentimes have an exclamation point at the end, and a lot of times they're not a full phrase. They're just a single word or a couple words, um, which give a sense of the person's mood or feeling. Something like this. If someone says, whoa, or boo, or yay, um, wow, like these words are exclamation phrases. They don't necessarily ask anything. They don't command anything. They don't claim anything, but they tell you how the person might be feeling at that time. So if somebody says, whoa, you can interpret that they're surprised or whatever, puzzled by something. If they say boo, then you can interpret that they're upset or dissatisfied by something that they're seeing. Yay, that they're excited, happy, approving. Um, so whether it's these three or the exclamation category, we've got different types of sentences. And I just want to close this by re repeating that it's only these, though, that fill the position of premises and conclusions within arguments. Okay, so now I just have one or two more little things to tell you guys before we're done for today and then we're good for the weekend. Um, now there are certain words that we have in logic and language which indicate that the conclusion of an argument is about to be stated. Okay, and those are called conclusion indicator words. Hmm. Okay, so like, say we have this argument that I'm just making up right now. Um, Jones, um, 
said he wanted to kill Smith. <clears throat> Jones' DNA um, is on the murder weapon. Maybe he's got blood or tissue on the murder weapon. Conclusion, um, Jones is the killer. So suppose I'm a detective or you know a lawyer or something, and I'm trying to convince you Jones is the killer. So I give you this argument based on these pieces of evidence. He said he wanted to do it. Maybe we found a witness testimony or writings or something. And then uh, we went and did a forensic investigation of the crime scene, and we obtained DNA that matches his. So these two things lead us to the conclusion that he's the killer. But I'm asking you this. What are some words words that might be spoken or written right before you mention this conclusion? When you're reading it from top to bottom, what little word might just precede the assertion of that conclusion? There's a, there's a sort of genre of these conclusion indicator words. Some of them I know are probably already in your vocabulary. Some I've already said today in passing, but let's all put them on the table now. So it's a conclusion word. It's a word that means this thing next is the summation of my argument. So uh, let's hear it. What do you think could be some good examples of conclusion indicator words? Okay, very good. One of them is therefore, exactly. And that is probably the most popular, well-known member of this set. So therefore is a good one. Stephen, exactly, that's another one, thus. And I see here Oliver with hence, and that's another one, correct. Um, therefore, thus, hence, those are three of the big three. There's, there's a few more, though. There's one more, I think, that's actually quite common and very um, used in a widespread way by everybody. Henceforth, not so much Kellen. It's just got to be hence, because henceforth has a slightly different meaning. Henceforth means like after this in time. So I could say, um, I stubbed my toe, and henceforth, I never wore sandals after that, meaning after that moment in time, I decided never to do it again. Hence, though, just expresses that this concludes... So we wouldn't add the word forth. Uh, Elizabeth, the word so, exactly, that's a very good one, and I was hoping someone would mention that. Um, so is one of the most commonly used in everyday speech. If I say to you, like, you know, I'm not feeling so well, so I'm going to stay home. I just say that, but that's actually an argument right there. What's the reason that I'm not going to go or why I'm going to stay home? Because I'm not feeling well. And then I say so, here's what comes from that, so I will stay home. In conclusion, that's another fine one. In conclusion, um, if you have more, let me know, but I've got a few others. There's consequently, um, it follows that. If you want to get it really fancy, there's this old school Latin conclusion indicator word that's not so common outside of the academy, but there's ergo. Ergo. Um, Subsequently, no, Alex, that's not one of them, actually. Subsequently just means afterward. Again, it's kind of like henceforth. So I could say that, you know, I woke up this morning, and subsequently I had lunch, and subsequently I taught a lecture. But that's not an argument where I gave premises toward a conclusion. I'm just speaking about the order of events in the day. But here we go. These are all good examples of conclusion words, and they would all be able to be plugged in here. So, like, let me read it off. Uh, Jones said he wanted to kill Smith, and Jones' DNA is on the murder weapon. Therefore, he's the killer. He said he wanted to kill Smith, his DNA is on the murder weapon, thus he's the killer. Hence, he is the killer. So, Jones is the killer. In conclusion, Jones is the killer. Consequently, he's the killer. Ergo, he's the killer. So those words, now you know that when you hear them or you see them on the page, this is an argument that's been given to you. And you can sort of decode then what the premises are by looking at what followed before or what preceded, I should say, the uh, statement of the conclusion indicator word. Now, here's the last thing. There are also some premise indicator words, guys. And these are words that you would say before providing one of the evidence statements. Okay, so there's a couple of those, and we should try to know those as well. So say you're about to present this argument, and you're going to say these uh, premise statements. What are some words that would be uttered before each of them which would indicate that these are going to be reasons for another thing. These are going to be reasons for some conclusion to follow. Blank Jones said he wanted to kill Smith, and blank Jones' DNA is on the murder weapon, therefore he's the killer. 
So what could fill the blank? Not in addition, though, Kellen, because you can say it at the top. Wouldn't that be weird? In addition, Jones said he wanted to kill Smith, but in addition would be the first thing you're saying, which doesn't make much sense. No, it can't be additionally, like I'm saying, because you can say it before number one. Additionally means adding on to something, but if it's the first thing, it's not adding from anything before. So no. Um, yeah, and it's not. It's also not for example, because for example is just like saying, um, yeah, for example doesn't mean that there's an implication that comes from the example. Also, Nathan, no, not from what we know either, because that does not indicate that this is something that follows from them. Since, there you go, Oliver, since. That's a major one, okay? So, like, you've heard this said. Since Jones said he wanted to kill Smith, and since his DNA is on the murder weapon, therefore, follows that he killed since is probably one of the big ones, but there's another one that's even more widespread. Think about this. You would say this, and what this word kind of means is here's a reason for something else. Since is one of them. Like, you know, since I, um, yeah, good, because. There you go. That's the other main one that I was hoping we'd get into. Because. Because Jones said he wanted to kill Smith, and since his uh, DNA is on that weapon, it follows that he's the killer. Okay, so due to the fact that would be another one. Good there, Alex. Due to the fact that Jones said he wanted to kill Smith, and since, you know, because his DNA is on the murder weapon, thus he's the killer. Okay, so other examples include given that. Because Jones said he wanted to kill Smith, and given that his DNA is on the murder weapon, it follows that, consequently, he's the killer. Okay, so these are words which reveal that the information provided is a reason for something else. Because of this, something else. You know, um, here's, a, here's a fact, sad fact to me. My bike got stolen, like, last year um, off of my own property, right, from my, within my own balcony. And so... I was thinking about it. Why did it get stolen? And, you know, I came to this conclusion uh, because I didn't lock the bike. Therefore, it got stolen. You know, so what's the conclusion? It got stolen from my property. What are the reasons and the evidence that I give for theft? Because I didn't properly secure it. Therefore, it got taken away. It's because of that that this other thing happened. It's since I did that that it got stolen. I mean, it's not only because of that. Obviously, the person didn't have a right to trespass. But, you know, if I had secured it better, then they wouldn't, they wouldn't have mattered. Um, I could say because I didn't secure it and because someone was willing to jump upon my balcony, therefore my bike got stolen. Um, I could say because every state certified Biden's win and since we've never had widespread election fraud in 250 years, Biden fair and square won the election. You know, But I'm giving reasons. I'm saying because of this and since that and due to this other fact, given those things, this follows. Okay, so I'm just kind of cluing you guys into some terminology. That's been the main point of our first meeting. So now I'm just going to review and recap, and we're good to go. Um, we started by mentioning what's a good critical thinker and a bad critical thinker. It's a difference between a person who needs evidence and arguments before they're willing to believe something and a person who doesn't even care, and they just believe things whether there's good reasons or not. Arguments. Arguments are two or more sentences where you've got a conclusion at the bottom and some number of premises above. The conclusion is the statement you want to prove. Premises are the evidence that justify that back it up. Uh, there's no such thing as an argument which is a single sentence by itself. It has to be backed by some kind of given reasons. Um, the point of the arguments is to show that the conclusion is true, meaning that it matches the facts of reality. Beliefs are different from truth. It means it's something you think is true, but a belief can in some cases be false and incorrect. Um, after that, I guess we just talked about what are the different types of sentences. You've got assertions. You've got questions and you've got commands. And then I guess we're wrapping up now with the conclusion and premise indicator word discussion. Some conclusion indicator words include therefore, thus, hence, so, consequently, ergo, and premise indicator words are evidence words, which indicate that there's a piece of evidence for a conclusion. Things like because, since, given that, um, for the reason that, due to the fact that. Okay, so that's about it for today's meeting, guys. Um, Thanks so much for being here, attending, and making the lecture interesting and interactive. Um, just so you know, it's going to be the same way going forward. So now that you've attended one meeting on YouTube Live, you know the format. You're going to come back to YouTube Live Tuesdays, Thursdays, 2.20.
and we will just hang out for you know 80 minutes, whatever, get in these notes, and then you'll be on to the rest of your day. So um, if you need anything between now and um, Tuesday, just let me know by email, and I'll be checking my messages. But um, that's about it for today, guys. So thanks so much for everything, and I'll certainly see you guys back um, after the weekend. So have a good one, and until then, uh, stay safe, stay healthy. I'll see you guys then in a few days. Okay, bye-bye. <clears throat> Feel free to like or say goodbye, anything in the chat, just so I'm sure we're all on the same page. Bye-bye, guys. Take it easy. Okay. Take care.